Welcome back students to our Chemistry 1510 video notes. In this video we're going to look at atomic and ionic sizes. Before we can get into atomic and ionic sizes we have to talk about some rules that are in charge of these things. So these rules are probably things that you have experienced before if you have played with magnets as a child. So when we look at magnets we know that oppos oppositely charged particles attract each other. So that means the north end of a magnet and the south end of a different magnet are going to be attracted to each other. Just like that in chemistry, a positive ion and a negative ion are going to be attracted to each other. We also know that if we take two north sides of a magnet and we try and force them together, they're going to repel. And so just like in chemistry, if we have a negative and a negative next to each other, they're going to repel. We also know that if we make our magnet, magnet bigger, then the attraction gets stronger. The same thing is going to happen in chemistry. If we go from talking about a plus one ion and a minus one ion being attracted to each other to a plus two ion attracted maybe to a minus one ion, this attraction is going to be greater. And as the two ions get closer to each other, the force of attraction, if they're attracted to each other, gets stronger. Or if they're repulsed by each other, then as they get closer together, the force of repulsion gets stronger. So one way that we look at these kinds of relationships is when we consider an atom, and here I have a Bohr model of lithium, and with this Bohr model of lithium, I have my core electrons and I have my valence electrons. Remember, the valence electrons are the outer electrons, and those are the ones that we really care about when it comes to bonding. So what we're going to calculate is the effective nuclear charge. The effective nuclear charge is the net positive charge from the nucleus that an electron experiences. And when we calculate the effective nuclear charge, which is abbreviated as Z effective, we're usually calculating this for the valence electrons. So let's look at this very simple version where we're considering lithium. In this um, Bohr model of lithium, you have your nucleus at the center. And remember, your nucleus contains your protons and your neutrons. And then you have your electrons surrounding this. And the lithium atom has three protons here. So the charge, which is Z, is a plus three. Then, if we're trying to figure out what the Z effective is for the valence electron, what we need to do is consider how these core electrons interact or interfere with the charge that the valence electron is feeling. So imagine that the electrons that are your core electrons, that these are essentially creating a barrier, right? They're creating a shield. They're blocking, they're protecting, they're surrounding that positively charged nucleus, which prevents the valence electron from feeling that full positive three charge. And a physicist actually did some calculations to see what kind of charge uh, uh, what kind of feeling these electrons are causing. So how much are they blocking that um, positive charge from the nucleus? 
So this blocking uh, phenomenon we call shielding, right? So this protecting uh, nature that's happening. And when we look at lithium, for example, and we're trying to calculate the Z effective for that valence electron, what we do is we consider the Z, which is the charge from the protons, and then we subtract S, which is the shielding effect. And what that physicist calculated was for each core electron, each core electron um, essentially is kind of like it blocks out 0.85 of a proton. So if you have two core electrons, you multiply that by 0.85, and that's how much those two core electrons are blocking the charge that the valence electron is feeling. So what we can do is go through and calculate these z-effectives. Now these z-effectives are actually really important because they are the basis for explaining atomic size uh, trends and ionization energy trends. And unfortunately, it's not as easy as just this. Because what if we had a more complex example where we also had more than one valence electron. So before we go to the top of the next page, we'll just fill in our final answer as 1.3. So that's the Z effective for that valence electron for lithium. Here is an example that's more complex. So we're looking now at calcium. When we consider calcium, calcium, if we write out its electron configuration, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s2, uh, 3p6, and then ending with 4s2. So all of these electrons are the core electrons for calcium, and these two are the valence. Oops. So when we do this calculation, we can calculate the Z effective for the valence electron for calcium. We put in the charge for calcium. Calcium is atomic number 20, which means it has 20 protons. And then we need to subtract whatever the S value is. But here the shielding constant is gonna be different for calcium. We already know that there's 18 core electrons and each core electron shields 0.85. Then the thing that makes calcium different than our prior example is that calcium has two valence electrons. If you are trying to figure out what the shielding constant is, you have to take into account that the valence electron that you're not calculating uh, is still present. So because there's two valence electrons, the other valence electron shields 0.35 worth. And so using this, where what we're doing is we're taking our, I'm gonna scroll a little bit, there we go. We're taking our S and saying number of core electrons minus the 0.85 shielding constant plus the number of valence electrons minus 1 times 0.35 and that's your shielding constant. Notice how I'm taking the number of valence electrons minus 1 because that then takes out of the equation the um, the fact that you shouldn't be counting the valence electron you're trying to calculate for. So then once you have your shielding constant, you can plug that in and you get a Z effective for calcium for, uh, for is plus 4.35. So let's start to look at this Z effective idea as a trend. When we consider the following diagram, which is comparing sodium and magnesium. 
what we're doing is we're looking at how sodium has a nucleus, magnesium has a nucleus, in that nucleus are the positive electron, or I'm sorry, <laughs> the positive protons. So sodium has 11 protons, magnesium has 12 protons. In both of these examples, what you're seeing is that you have 10 core electrons. So here we are, 10 core electrons. What's changing is the number of valence electrons and the number of protons. So your core electrons didn't change. So if you were to go through and calculate the Z effective for each of these, you would come up with point, I'm sorry, plus point, oh goodness, plus 2.5 for sodium and a positive 3.15 for magnesium. So what this means is that there is a trend going across the periodic table that Z effective increases. And then there's also a um, an important relationship here. And that is related to atomic size. So atomic size is just the distance between the nucleus and the outermost electron, of course, which is your valence electron. So the whole reason we talk about Z effective is so that we can really understand why your atomic radius is decreasing as you go from left to right across the periodic table. This is really easy to get mixed up and it boggles people's minds because people are uh, automatically thinking, well, if I go this way across the periodic table, I have more electrons, so shouldn't I have a bigger size? And the answer is no, because of Z effective. When we look at Z effective, this is the measure of how much the valence electron is attracted to the nucleus. The greater the attraction, the more tightly those outermost electrons are going to be held and they're going to be brought in closer to that nucleus. And so because we see an increase in Z effective, and an increase in Z effective means those outermost electrons are being pulled closer to the center of the atom, which decreases the distance between the nucleus and that outermost electron. So what we end up seeing is when we have a greater Z effective, we have a smaller radius. The atomic size trend this way is not really um, as much related to Z effective. Um, what matters more here is that as we are going down a column, we're seeing an atomic radius increase because if this is my nucleus and this is hydrogen, I have one layer of electrons. As I go to lithium, I add another layer of electrons. As I go to sodium, I add another layer. Potassium, another layer. Rubidium, another layer. And so what ends up happening is as we go down, we're adding more and more layers onto that atom which of course then increases the distance between the nucleus and the outermost electron as you're adding more layers. So this one tends to make intuitive sense to people, whereas this ends up really confusing some folks. So to wrap up this video, let's also talk about ionic size. Ionic size is going to be the distance between the nucleus and the outermost electron, which is the valence electron, um, with respect to an ion. So it's the same as the atomic size except instead of talking about something that's neutral, we're just talking about something that's charged.
So let's try and break down this picture a little bit because it can get a little confusing. So these numbers here are your row or your period on the periodic table. These numbers up here are the groups or the columns. So we're looking at lithium, sodium, and magnesium first. Notice how there's two circles here. Well, two half circles. Over on the yellow part, the yellow is showing the atom and the green is showing the ion. And so what this is hoping to illustrate is that for things like lithium, sodium, and magnesium that all form positive ions, we're going to see that the uh, ion is smaller than the atom. And this is gonna make sense because if we look at lithium, which has two layers of electrons, this is the lithium atom. It has one valence electron in the second energy level. Whereas lithium ion has one less layer because you've taken away that outermost electron. And so because you're removing a layer of electrons, the distance between the nucleus and the outermost electron, so this distance is going to decrease as you remove layers. So then essentially the opposite thing is happening for your atoms that form negative ions. For your atoms that form negative ions, what is occurring is you are going to experience, well I guess not you, but the atom when it gains an electron is going to experience more repulsive forces. So if we look at something like fluorine, there's still only two layers of electrons. Before we went from fluorine to fluoride, so if this is fluorine, there's seven electrons in that outer shell. Whereas if we do fluoride, we're gonna add another electron here. And so with that additional electron come electron-electron repulsions. Those electrons don't wanna be close to one another. And so what they do is they spread out to take up more space. So in this case, your atom is shown here in red and your ion is shown here in purple. And this is showing you that as you add an electron, the size is going to greatly increase because those electrons don't wanna be anywhere near one another. So they spread out and they take up more space. So you should be ready for some exam questions that ask you things like ranking the size of atoms or the size of ions. Those are very typical questions. That's enough for this video. As always, thank you for your attention. This is Katoni signing out.